term. They're, you know, to date, Canadians have been remarkably supportive of what's been asked of them um, and what's being required of them by law. Uh, but, you know, our ability to maintain that, our own willingness, our mental health, um, it's, it's going to get stressed over time. So one of the things, you know, during this uh, crisis, though, that I think one of the silver linings I'll start with is it's also driven to me a remarkable return to the sense of civic duty uh, and our, our sense of duty to one another. And that was something that I can tell you in my time as mayor, which is now 10 years. I really worried about the erosion of that over time. And it's easy to blame populism. And yes, that's, that's caused some of that erosion of belief in our ability to collectively solve problems and, and act in each other's best interests. But I'll tell you what I've seen in the first three weeks uh, of this is a remarkable uh, degree of consensus in our part of the world uh, around the need to participate in that. And then to go to the next level, you know, um, these Facebook groups, which I've talked about, you know, there's a couple of them locally, the um, Barry Music Live, which has just been incredible raising money for uh, local support organizations, but also the Barry Families Unite page, which is up to almost 10,000 members. And is it's a sharing platform. And the, you know, one of the things I think that's going to be interesting out of in the post-COVID world is how is this sort of, um, can we sustain because I think I, I really want us to, can we sustain this temporary, hopefully not temporary, increased degree of care for one another, increased interest in collective problem solving? Can we sustain that over the term as a society? And uh, can we use these platforms, which we're, we were already starting to do? I mean, one of the really wonderful things in the last two or three years is the way the sharing economy has also been able to be used to solve social problems in some cases. Um, in some cases, it's been used for early um, business purposes, uh, but in other cases, it's been used to try and tackle social problems. So can we um, take some of these things that are happening organically right now and create a culture locally that sustains that? Um, can we build some infrastructure around it so that the degree to which people are willing to uh, assist one another, whether they are talking about building their, their small businesses, whether they are talking about supporting uh, vulnerable populations, whatever that is, um, uh, moving forward. And I think one of the other, the other pieces that's, that's sort of related to that is um, a greater understanding of, you know, that we're, we're a much, um, it, it's a much bigger issue than just hospital capacity uh, what we what we need to be thinking about is a healthy society, and uh, you know there's some dire sort of predictions that are saying, well, now we're going to have to learn to live live alone or live apart uh, for the longer term, either because people are going to choose to do that out of fear, even after restrictions are lifted, uh, or because you know there's going to be ongoing waves and we're going to have to. Well, there may be ongoing waves and echo waves where uh, this pump the brakes approach that you may have heard about. Um, will be that you know restrictions will come off, will return to some semblance of pre-COVID uh, economy and society, but then we'll have to, you know, later on in the year, we'll have to pump the brakes again and do distancing again for a while to, to slow the, a, a second wave. That's possible. And, um, you know, I think the, the, the need for collective action, and therefore for me, what I was saying a minute ago, that need for collective action may, may be something we actually have to sustain. But we can use that to tackle social problems. And we can use that to shift the dialogue that we've had for years in this country around building acute care capacity only to tackle health issues and shift it to a discussion of how we can have a healthy population, how we can address the determinants of health. Now, I know this is an entrepreneur's call, so I want to shift a little bit to the economic impact of what I think that, that means. Um, I, I think. You know, when we start talking about determinants of health, we're talking about uh, long-term care. So where has COVID hit the hardest? Long-term care. And God, anybody working in a long-term care home right now is a freaking hero as far as I'm concerned. I mean, to be willing to go to work every day knowing that those environments are extremely challenging uh, in terms of limiting the spread of the virus uh, is, is incredible. Um, I think there's some very real questions this is gonna raise about the model 
of long-term care that we should have as a society. And I was doing some thinking about over the weekend about, you know, is the built form part of the problem? Do we need to start having long-term care that is in our communities, in a residential setting where people are in four and six bed long-term care facilities that are built like homes? And we, we sort of break it up that way, but they operate in a network. And we use medical technology, which is emerging now, to assist more people with care at home. That's a huge economic opportunity. Anybody who is in a service delivery, in a technology platform business, in a, um, in, in healthcare equipment, uh, or or even in training, um, I think there are you know new service models that we need to be thinking about that are part of responding not just to a pandemic, but actually thinking about how can we prevent people from having to go to the hospital in the first place. I think more broadly, uh, as an economic trend as well, you know, this has laid bare some weaknesses in global supply chains. Now, I'm kind of one of those economic patriots that loves the idea that we can replace dependency on foreign sources with local sources. That's a very dangerous view, though. Uh, unfortunately, in some cases, that's the kind of protectionism that we've seen our neighbor to the south engage in. Um, which can ultimately be very damaging in an integrated world economy. So to me, the question is not about protectionism and replacing. It's about redundancy. It's about how can we actually have our manufacturers have local and global supply chains? How can we look at uh, producing products? I mean, we've seen local employers retool now uh, to be supplying the needs of, of, of the fight against COVID. Um, how can we take that agility, which was, I mean, I shout out to Georgian College who have been providing some of the R&D for local companies. I mean, we've watched over the last few weeks, companies shift entirely what they're producing on a dime. I mean, on Wednesday, March the 12th or 13th, whatever it was, the day that the NBA shut down in the evening and COVID went from something that was maybe coming from overseas to being a reality in North America that next day, the Thursday. Um, everything changed. And since that day, the amount of retooling and flexibility that our manufacturers have shown uh, is truly remarkable. So how do we make that an economic project where we, we, we build flexibility into our economy to be able to adapt? Um, I think one of the strengths that that, that would create for us uh, as a country is uh, the ability to adapt to other shocks and the ability to adapt to a broader uh, crisis. Let's not forget, we, were, we are in the middle of, of, of a uh, existential crisis in terms of climate change. And the retooling of our economy to be a low carbon economy is a mandatory change. I mean, it has to happen. And uh, how could we, as a silver lining, take this period of intense disruption to business models and think about how we come out of this with the flexibility to adopt new business models. A lot of this to me, and this is maybe the last thing I wanna talk about, is gonna have to come from um, uh, uh, organically up from uh, businesses themselves. I mean, I expect leadership from our largest employers in addressing changes, whether they are long-term existential ones like climate change or emergencies like COVID. Um, but where I see the new business models that are going to try and embrace this, uh, the, the realities of, 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 uh, of a post-COVID world, I think those new business models are gonna come out of, of people who are thinking about the issue today of how do I build in resiliency into my business model? How do I diversify my production so that um, I can respond to uh, a faster pace of change or, or a larger scale change? Than before? And um, if there's a, you know, a sort of silver lining around a period of intense disruption like this, especially one where we're forced to suspend everything about, about our, our traditional activity and, and try and create the infrastructure for change. It's that I think over the, the time that's in front of us, whether that is a month, two months, four months, on and off again for a year, whatever it looks like, um, 
it's now forced upon us. So uh, the last thing I guess I'll say, I already said it was the last thing, so I guess this is the real last thing. You know, there will be a recovery. And government's traditional response to the need for an economic recovery is to say, let it pump a ton of money into infrastructure, because that's a great way to put everybody back to work. You go back to the Great Depression. What was the economic solution to the Great Depression? It was the New Deal. And great things did come out of that, but it was fundamentally about building physical infrastructure, to some, to some extent social infrastructure, but it was the 30s, so a lot of it was physical infrastructure. The Marshall Plan was the recovery plan for the Second World War for Europe, and that was about rebuilding, uh, fundamentally about rebuilding bricks and mortar and, and hard infrastructure. Um, this time, and I really would push you back to Gladwell, like listen to what he has to say about this because it is incredibly astute. This time it's not just gonna be hard infrastructure. It would be a mistake for us to do that. I think you're gonna see that. Tradition, I mean, governments do this. This is what they do. That's every stimulus plan, the stimulus plan after the financial crisis 10 years ago was, here's a ton of money to build stuff. And it's good, that's good. But it's not enough and it's not, it, to me it's not gonna be the right solution in a post COVID world. We need to be building the social infrastructure as well, which looks like everything from new models for long-term care, new models for addressing the social determinants of health, um, networks instead of just bricks and mortar, uh, human infrastructure, human capital instead of bricks and mortar. And that's the kind of recovery plan I hope that our leaders at the, in Ottawa and, and Queens Park are thinking about. And what I want us as a community to think about, how do we come out of this and say, we are not just gonna build you know, a billion dollars of bricks and mortar, or if we do, we're gonna build that with an eye to filling the gaps in the social infrastructure that uh, have been laid bare in part by COVID, uh, but are also necessary to address the longer term challenges in front of us like climate change and like a healthier society. Um, so that's some big picture thinking for early on a Easter Monday morning, but um, I'll leave it there and I'd be delighted to chat about whatever aspect of this people wanna to, want to talk about. Thank you so much, Jeff, uh, and thank you for that. Um, we have, uh, I know we have some questions starting to percolate in the chat. Um, so I'm going to cancel you out of the spotlight video so that everyone's all in the spotlight together. <laughs> and um, so my recommendation for those in the group that are interested in asking a question is to put it in the chat. Um, we can unmute you if you'd like to ask your question yourself or if you, um, let's see, I'll ask Jenna to come back online too. Um, Mira, I'm going to see if I can unmute you if you are interested in asking the question that you had. And Mira, Ray? Yeah, I'm, hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Hi there. Um, so thank you, Jeff. Uh, yes, definitely it was great to take that high level um, perspective and thinking about what things to look forward to when when the world opens for business as i as i keep saying um i think will be really helpful for our community is to understand what the some some tacticals you know right now we're in this period of sitting yeah. on our own reflecting planning are there any very tactical things that we can do to prepare ourselves for that slow ease back into society and then once we are in that phase what can we be doing at that point yeah Thanks for that. And so now I'll talk like the business owner I was until 10 years ago. Everybody's got their challenge right now of gearing down their expenses to match whatever your surviving revenue model is, right? So for those in sectors that have been able to largely continue with activity, and, that, and there are some rare ones that are seeing higher activity, medical equipment, essential services, and so on, uh, you know, you've got the luxury of maybe tactically moving to, to grow. Um, but for the vast majority, it's how do you to gear down your expenses to, to survive at this you know lower gear that you're going to have to operate in i think number one issue how how can you preserve some of your revenue stream how do you preserve your customer uh, base and loyalty um, by reaching out to them online uh, so one of the ver first things that we did with our economic support task force at the city was uh, with our partners at georgian and uh, the um, sandbox uh, and the Small Business Center uh, was trying to assist businesses with going online. So tactically, there's a great thing to do. Take the time to invest in your online presence. Take the time to try and grow your, your customers online, even if it's your followers, even if they're not buying right now. 
um, build your build your footprint online if you can. Uh, that's all that that's lasting benefit. That's gonna that's gonna benefit you forever, right? Um, but it's also something that you can can do um, right now. Um, I think you know as a as a broader ecosystem, I think we have to ask ourselves the questions like if our revenue models are going to be less about people walking in the door, whatever the door is, um, what, is that, what does that look like? Um, is it going to be more business to business or, or business to organizations? Are our restaurants you know, now going to be cooking meals for long-term care because we're going to have a different model of, of long-term care, which is home-based? Uh, can, can you be part of a network of providing food to um, people who are going to be aging in place? I mean. That's a kind of look forward on a strategic level, but tactically, you know, how can you prepare for that kind of kind of revenue model? But it, you know, to be honest, I, I know that every, lots of everybody's in survival mode, and 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 that's you know job number one. Um, and I guess I would take the opportunity because I've got an audience here to say uh, if there is um, something that we can be pushing for here at the city. Uh, we would be delighted to do that. Uh, we're going to have a discussion around one of the remaining costs that we know is out there, which is a uh, water and wastewater bills uh, that we control. But you know, rent is a huge thing. For example, for many of you who are small businesses, if you're not getting rent relief, that can be crushing. Uh, we are already pushing the province to do something about rent relief, but uh, I'm not sure whether <laughs> we've got a commitment on that yet. So um, let us know. Um, what we can be doing, uh, because we are hearing that from, from other business associations. That's great. Thank you. And then just going to the chat and related to what you had just mentioned, um, we have a couple of, uh, probably a few landlords that are part of this group. Um, <clears throat> and Adrian, I'll just call out your question. He said, is there going to be anything in place for landlords who rely on tenants rent each month and if they can't afford it anymore and any incentives for this once um, this is over to help us to continue to provide housing as it's a difficult time for all of us? Yeah, so the residential landlord piece is really, really difficult. I, I think one of the, the um, pieces that the federal government went partway on and didn't go all the way is um, you know, mortgage relief. I think if, if if there's going to be a serious effort in this country to provide residential rent relief, you know, it sort of has to follow through the chain. The landlord, um, you know, if it's deferral and you're going to be made whole, but you're taking a risk, then the government needs to backstop that, you know, with some uh, capability to, uh, to allow landlords to um, be forgiven uh, and receive some degree of support. So for example, the offer to small businesses was, 10 grand forgivable, 40 grand in total credit, you know, is there some equivalent there that can assist um, landlords who've, who've had their revenue go to zero because their tenants have gone to zero and blood from a stone, right? Um, so this is, you know, they didn't go far enough with mortgage deferral because it was only for, for primary residences. Um, I think, you know, on the commercial side, uh, you're seeing some bigger landlords in Canada that are being very flexible. You are also seeing some big ones that are being not at all flexible, uh, and that's unfortunately going to put some people out of out of business. And um, I, the scale of that financially is very substantial, but we are pushing both the province and the federal government, for what it's worth, to try and assist with that. Okay, thank you. Um, we had a really great question here about um, from Patricia. Uh, Lancia, who's saying um, if it's yep. possible to push for relaxed zoning and bylaw changes to allow more businesses to operate from residential addresses. So an example of that would be allowing commercial kitchens and homes so that food producers can still produce their food on a smaller scale. So uh, that's a great question. Um, and I was just having a, a discussion uh, around food, uh, local food production uh, last night. Um, I think one of the, uh, the you know, it's, there's, there's everything from the sort of backyard garden, which you can do today, um, but which, you know, programs like Urban Pantry and others could probably assist with on a community level to, um, you know, how do we uh, try and encourage more of a local supply chain for fresh food? Uh, and I think that is one of the outcomes of this that really I would love to see um, uh, 
become more institutionalized in the way of by the way of infrastructure if the specific question about zoning and so forth is you know with regards to backyard livestock and things like that um, there's nothing in the works right now there's a lot of people who are very nervous around that issue because of the perception of where the the covid came from and so on um, but you know there's a lot of bad information out there about that as well uh, i would say that um, the the community garden program uh, in Barry, I would love to see ramp up, you know, 10x coming out of this. I think there's a lot of opportunities for people to do that. Um, you know, I think the other thing uh, is the food handling restrictions that were put in place, ironically enough, by public health, <laughs> have made it now that you can't cook in your home for for an institution, right? Like you can't you can't do that unless you have your food handling certification, unless your kitchen is is covered uh, as a commercial kitchen and so forth. The reality right now though is we have like 500 idled commercial kitchens in the city. We don't need more. What we need is to get those commercial kitchens activated and part of the food chain. And I think uh, one of the things that we've been working on is a program called Care Kitchen, which would see restaurants in Barrie uh, be able to go back to work uh, to provide food um, uh, both for delivery for individuals, which they're doing today on a commercial basis, but which we could also do uh, for people at risk, vulnerable populations. Um, that was done actually first about two weeks ago, right after COVID started in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, where they got, uh, I think it was 20 restaurants, and they actually uh, were paid to operate as commercial kitchens as part of the broader food supply. I think that could be uh, very, very helpful. Uh, and I think the other piece, longer term, that would be interesting would be a social enterprise approach to that, where uh, we start to have uh, social enterprises operating those kitchens. And again, the partnership with the restaurant sector, I mean, we have a huge strength in this city. We have over 400 restaurants in Barrie. We have a very high uh, and strong food and drink sector. Uh, and as we've seen already, they're very civic minded, many, many operators who have already kicked in. Um, so I think that's something I'd like us to organize. When I was talking about things that could come out of COVID and be sustained social infrastructure, this is a great piece and opportunity. Excellent. And um, I'm in the chat and I just wanted to let everyone know in case you're worried, I will try to get to every single question within the time. So if I'm asking them out of order, please don't think that I've skipped you at all. <laughs> Um, okay, so there is a question here um, from Johnny Corner um, relating to bylaws and restrictions to tree service and landscaping companies that have a small amount of employees. Mm. And a follow up question around um, support coming out for small family owned businesses that have just started up in recent years that don't qualify for yeah. the government programs. So, um, on the first question, yeah, Lynn, it's funny when, when you Put out a list of essential businesses i'm talking about ontario here now the devil is in the details so quickly i mean that list was super long when it first came out and a lot of people went well geez what the heck like you're not shutting down anything one great example was dry cleaners people are like you know what let's we can live without iron shirts like why on earth are dry cleaners still being allowed to operate well i'll tell you why they do the laundry for most first responders so in barry uh, most of our first responders and even a, a chunk of medical staff um, have their clothes washed and uh, like the uniforms by dry cleaners. So yeah, the, you're right. The retail trade for guys like me walking in and getting their shirts done maybe is not as essential, but you know, they, they perform that function. Landscaping is a similar one. And that's why I use that example. Um, there was a lot of confusion around what companies are allowed to operate because it said like, you know, essential maintenance, landscaping companies can continue with essential maintenance. Well, what does that mean? It, it basically means, well, not gardening, but like, you know, maintaining sidewalks and maintaining um, uh, entries to property and keeping driveways open and snow clearing at the time. So um, unfortunately, you have to sort of talk to the Ontario government for real clarity around some of these essential businesses. Um, on the family owned business, this has been a huge uh, problem, I think, in the initial rollout of government support for business. Um, initially, the, the steps that were taken were, were not sufficient to help sole proprietors, to help uh, one, two, three, four person uh, businesses, and even, you know, owner managed uh, small businesses. I had a, 
guy who runs a shop in a strip plaza in the south end of Mapleview. And we had a lot of exchange on Facebook around this. Um, I think what I'm seeing now is getting a little better. We keep being told the wage subsidy piece is going to apply very broadly. Um, and, you know, I trust that's true because they, they just passed it in the Senate yesterday over the weekend uh, in, in Ottawa. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the what we're, what we're all hoping is that, you know, that wage subsidy isn't just like for your employees, it's for your sole proprietors. It's, I made as a self-employed individual, $50,000 last year. That just went to 10 because I've only been able to hold on to one fifth of my clients. Um, you should be edge as eligible for a wage subsidy as, you know, a large business. Um, so, you know, we still, we're still getting some conflicting stuff. And I think one of the mistakes the government made is the first thing they rolled out was that $8,000 loan. And everybody's sort of saying, a forty thousand dollar loan, if I can get it, is not going to help me. I'm out the revenue. I'm just that's just delaying my my cliff. Um, I need I need the direct support that seems to be offered to other sectors. I still trust it's coming. The finance minister said yesterday the money is going to be in bank accounts in two weeks, corporate like company bank accounts in two weeks. So let's hope they roll it out as broadly and easily as they seem to have succeeded with the CERB, the two thousand dollars a month. Um, which it seems like they just gave everybody. <laughs> uh, but you know, um, I also happen to be somebody who believes that a universal basic income might, might, or at least a crisis basic income this year, might not have been a bad way for them to go. That's great. And in the chat, there's a number of really great um, suggestions and feedback related to zoning and um you know people's own perspective on what that could look like and so a question that we've had come out is where can people submit this type of feedback yeah and that's funny i was talking about that on my morning call with my staff today because um you know we've the way i've reached out to uh the broader business community in barry was to put this task force together which has representatives from all of our industry associations and HBAC and the Sandbox and the Chamber of Commerce and others. I, I think that though is insufficient because we're missing some of the, the benefit of everybody else and there there is no monopoly on a good idea. I mean, always, like all of our channels are still open. You can you know, message the city, message myself. Um, you can be part of online discussions with uh, all of these organizations that I mentioned and so forth. But I think we're going to make a more direct appeal or push uh, to to have people give us their thoughts on both resiliency through the crisis and recovery after the crisis. Um, I think we we um, uh, you know out while we're in the midst of this, it may feel early or tone deaf to be talking about recovery. I think right now, though, what we should be talking about is what are those tactical moves that Mira said that we can be doing now as entrepreneurs or large businesses or the government in support of you um, that can have lasting benefit beyond the crisis. And, um, you know, the, the more broadly we open up the listening channels, the better the chance of, of having something come forward that we know is gonna be helpful. So watch for more on that. Um, I, I think that'll probably look like a couple of on, obviously a couple of online channels, but I'd like to broaden the number of these kinds of things that we're doing because it helps. That's great. Um, Kimberly had a really great, great question. Um, where should, this is on the, the note of where people can take their ideas, but Kimberly's is, uh, where should one take ideas that address assisting with improving the health of our at-risk population? Sorry, where can? Um, where should one take ideas that address assisting oh. with improving the health of our at-risk population? Well, that would be great to come to my office. Um, so we had, the, there were two task forces that I formed on day three of the crisis. One was the economic support task force that I just talked about with industry associations and, and trying to help businesses survive. Um, the other one was the social support task force, which is to, was to support vulnerable populations. So, you know, there were immediate concerns around homeless shelters uh, because of the inability to self-isolate or isolate at all or distance. Now most of our shelters have moved into hotels uh, in Barrie, um, which is a, a good solution, still, still issues to deal with, but a good solution. Um, food security was an early concern, but uh, the, 
the um, donations, the food bank and others have stepped up in such a way that the supply seems to be meeting the demand, which is not to say that that will continue through, you know, potentially months, um, but we've been pretty good there. Um, the question was, where can you submit those thoughts? Please do send them to my office, um, me online, um, office of the mayor at barry.ca is, is, is an email address. Um, or you can submit them, you can call Service Barry, you can submit them for any of the city's online channels, they will land with us. Because, um, you know, there's also a ton of organic stuff going on in the community. And again, you know, there's a, a woman who organized fish and chips delivery to 75 seniors uh, on Friday. I mean, this stuff is going on daily and, and as I say, on a very grassroots level. But if there are things that you think that we can be doing systemically, I would love to hear about them. Amazing. I, I do. I love some of those, you know, stories that kind of keep us going, like you just mentioned, <laughs> and yeah. looking for more ways to share those as well. Um, I ha I'm going to open it for Patricia to ask her question. Patricia Dent, you'll know who she is. Yes. Hi, Patricia. I'm just looking for you, Patricia, if you want to. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'm unmuted. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I love, I found out in talking to Kathleen Trainer about your task force, and I'm wondering what we can do uh, to help with that, um, with that task force. Is there something, because as you mentioned, there are a number of grassroots initiatives um, where, you know, in my program, we're trying to um, support one another and find ways that we can work together, um, pivot or support one another so that um, we can continue but I'm wondering if there's anything that we as a small business community can do to support that uh, initiative yeah I, I appreciate that and and I hate giving the uh, watch for more answer but <laughs> the, uh, we've really here's my take on where we all are right the first month we spent on on our level shutting things down like we right. shut down an organization that is 1100 uh, employees deliver 60 different services to the community and we had to manage the need to immediately begin social distancing for public health and the shutdown of like a third of the economy. Now we've just sort of moved into now this is the new normal for a little while and so now we can start thinking in, in a lot of ways about what can we do to to be ready for the longer term um, and for recovery. So I, you know, I think that that piece on resiliency, Patricia. I mean, in the short term, I, I've I've thought about, uh, you know, we've we've all had to shift our business models to where we can continue to operate. If you're not an essential service, um, but you're you're still selling something that you can feasibly deliver, throw all your effort into that. Reach out to all your customers. I mean, yeah, I know there's a lot of joke going jokes going around the business sort of community about that. Everyone's got an inbox full of emails from every business they've ever given their email to saying, here's what we're doing during COVID-19. Um, but, but you know what, I mean, so that's one thing. So yeah, okay, a MailChimp email to your customer base is one thing, but, but pivoting, I think you're exactly right. I mean, focusing on, on how much you can push out your opportunity to continue to sell online uh, for now. Um, but also to think about what's your strategy uh, going to be to try and come back. If you, you know, if you are a small business that's bricks and mortar based and you're going to open your doors again at some point, what's that going to look like? What's your, you know, how are you going to bring a customer base back in the door if you're dependent on them? Um, and, you know, I think, that, but the other thing just in the short term, because of this issue around lack of support for sole proprietors and, and, and the smallest of businesses, um, I think the, the effort to assist one another with actually accessing the federal support is a real thing because I've seen so many frustrated uh, business owners saying, I don't get it, there's nothing for me. Well, there are some things and I'm you know, hoping that the federal government as they did with the emergency relief benefit go from sort of very narrow, longer complex application with complex criteria to right. Right. making it much easier and and as they do that all of our groups should be you know sharing with one another like here's like here's my screenshot if you're willing to show it here's the steps i went through and here's how i access this support here's how i went to bdc for my loan here's how i i went online and got the cws and i i know some of that is to come in the next couple of weeks but that's where these group where our groups 
and we're very strong with this in Barry because there's so many strong business networking initiatives uh, that I think can really can help each other out. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Patricia. Good to see you. Um, I'm going to call on Trevor Howard from Media Suite, which is a local digital agency. Great agency if uh, you need anything website related, but I'll call Trevor out because he has a question. Cool. Hey, Trevor. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Good to see you. Um, yeah, you too. So we have been one of the businesses that you'd mentioned that are, have been, I guess, say fortunate enough to have seen an influx in businesses. As you've mentioned, people are looking to adapt to new ways of doing commerce, uh, even if it's simple things like uh, Allendale event having us add like a section to the site where they can communicate to customers how they're dealing with COVID and what the new precautions are. Uh, just now I updated Cottage Canoe's uh, takeout menu as they're trying to, to do stuff like that. So every day we're getting requests for ways to, uh, whether it's in the way of communication, but new ways to adapt. And of course, um, going e-commerce, like you said, which is a, definitely a more long tail investment. Um, just recently, we, we've, I think, finished this week, Spring Water Garden Center has opened up an e-commerce section for their tropical plants. Um, so doing a lot of stuff like that. We also know that we have limited capacity, so there's only so many websites that we can build. We also know that these things, um, you know, that they come with an investment, and at a time when businesses are struggling to make ends meet, it's potentially impossible for some to invest into going e-commerce, even though they know it's a good idea. So there's a bit of a catch-22 there. Um, so what I would like to table would be uh, sort of a, a donation that we were going to put forth to the city of Barrie and, and e-commerce. Um, kind of like, um, I, I thought of the name Uni unitymarket.ca seemed like a good name, but really it hasn't been named yet. But um, what I'm envisioning is a system where any business in town that sells a product or service could go in, register, and start um, adding in their own products. We can have a payment gateway per business so the money wouldn't like come to a pool and then we would distribute it it would literally be like their own e-commerce website like deposits directly into their account um anyways we can refine the details of how it works but i'm curious to know if the business would if the business community would utilize something like this before uh you know we put forth the time investment into building something like that um, so that like, would be like a barry etsy kind of thing Basically, yeah, yeah. And we'd look to do it without a subscription fee. Like we don't really want any, um, you know, monetary benefit from it. We're seeing is that like, you know, we'll, we'll get recognized as the company <laughs> <laughs> that, that did this for the, the community during a time of need. And that's pretty much all the payment that we'd be looking for. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of curious to see if, if people would use it. Um, you know, obviously it'll allow like places like John McNabb's Clothiers to pop up their inventory, what they have right now. Um, Creative Cafe could put on their um, take-home kits. Like there's, there's yeah. endless possibilities to the products because refining the logistics process of delivering products in a safe way has kind of been resolved. The curbside pickup works well, pickup, delivery, yeah. people are offering yeah. cleaning kits. There's all kinds of stuff in that. That seems to be possible. The difficulty is how do we make that transaction and how do we discover these products? Yeah, I love it. I mean, an online market, uh, you know, simple, simple location, um, lower barrier for companies to access, all those are great things. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the digital service squad and the Get Your Business Online initiative that was started with you and the other, the agency pool, I think there's 18 or 20 or 21 of you, I've forgotten now, that are all <laughs> providing service yep. to, you know, I think there, there could be a, a tremendous sort of collective project there. And, and I mean, I, I, I'm, big fan of this because it's building long-term capacity i mean it's not just a covid response I, I hope it would keep you know help keep everybody in business preserve some of their revenue mm -hmm. um but you know it also uh um uh, it creates that that long-term lasting benefit so yeah let's let's keep that conversation going for sure it's a great idea Cool. I know uh, in Ireland they uh, launched something very similar to this and it was uh, locally based as well and it's done really really well. I'll send you over the link to that and it seemed you know very nicely laid out and I know within Burnick uh, we've been talking about this and uh, even the potential to have something like a virtual market where you yeah. can actually go into a, a stall and see the person and talk in real time with them. So um, we have some great clients working on some things like that. Um, in addition, just one shout out, um, one of our clients at Burnick near dot shop, um, will do the delivery side of it. 
so there's a bunch of people kind of percolating on this topic. So I love that you brought it up and we can start to start to bring a collective together around it. Cool. Yeah, I love this idea too. Yeah, thanks, sure. Jeff. There's a, in the chat there, we see people donating their photography services. Uh, I'm just kind of skimming it, but like, it looks like a lot of people are on board. It's exciting. That's, that's so exciting. Um, yeah. I'll just call on John Pickard. I know he has a question and then I think I'll bring up Lachlan's question and then I think we're going to start to wind it down because I know Mayor Jeff, you have another meeting that happens. I do at 11, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just John, if you're available. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Your Worship. Thanks for Hi, doing uh, my question is about the Dunlop Street merchants. They've taken quite a hammering, um, first with the infrastructure improvements that were quite necessary and are going to be great for our city, but certainly impacted the, the uh, local merchants on Dunlop. Now we've got COVID, so it's a double whammy, and it's you know going to basically take a year out of their lives before we're done. I'm wondering what the city might be able to do to help that specific group. And also what the community, uh, people mm -hmm. Paul and others can do to help. Uh, yeah. So uh, some have very successfully pivoted to delivery and curbside pickup. Um, and I would shout out there to Lazy Tulip, Shador, some others who, who have been able to preserve some of their customer base and revenue stream by, by going to delivery uh, or pickup. Um, others, others are, are really struggling because they're, they're bricks and mortar and their, their magic is in their space, right? Um, one immediate thing we're looking at doing is, is uh, unfortunately, the way water bills work in the city right now, half of your bill is a fixed charge and you just get that every month even if you use zero water. Um, so we're looking at eliminating that for the billing cycle now so at least that takes that bill off their, their, um, their expense side, but that's a, that's a relatively small piece. More strategically, we decided to try and get the whole Dunlop Street project done during COVID. So, and I have to shout out to the contractor, Arnott, who has figured out a way to work safely with the distancing requirements. There are actually pieces of that project that I'm not sure they're gonna be able to do uh, until the restrictions come off because they, you have to have two guys close together. Um, but a lot of the work they are able to do and, and so they came to us and said, let's get the whole thing done basically while the street is shut down. So that should take what was gonna be another year worth of work and compress it so that hopefully by the time we come out of this, we're, we're done most of that project. Um, I think the, the, the other question though around, you know, the, the, what can we do as a community is continue to patronize them. I mean, they, they so many of them have, made delivery uh, a possibility. Uh, it still gives them some degree of revenue. Um, you know, I don't know that there's much more other than the, their landlords giving them some forgiveness on rent uh, that we can do to help them cut their expenses. Um, you know, most of them, the labor force unfortunately is either laid off or, or on the wage subsidy and hopefully they'll be able to get the wage subsidy. Um, but you know, there's probably not a lot more we can do to help them go to zero on, on expenses. Uh, what we need to do as a community is trying to, and, and it doesn't even matter whether they're downtown or on Bayfield Street or on Maple Uh, If they're continuing to offer their product and service, uh, try and continue to patronize them and, and uh, it, will, it will help. So anyway, I'm, I'm hoping if we can get the Dunlop Street escape project done, we will have an all new Dunlop Street coming out of these, right? Uh, and then I guess Lachlan, and then I'm going to have to jump off, I'm afraid. Okay, sure. And with Lachlan's, I think it's a good topic that we can actually explore in further coffee talks. He's discussing how um, some of his employees are making more with the CERB. And so for him to bring them back to work, it, you know, he might lose some of them. So I think this is also a topic that a lot of small businesses face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that was uh, something that's been raised, and it's been raised around grocery store workers too. I mean, what if you're in a situation where, you know, you're actually making more on a monthly basis, um, and you've seen grocery stores and essential services in some cases raise wages and uh, increase the number of hours. Now they've also seen increased demand. Grocery sales were up 38 percent in the first two weeks of the COVID crisis, partly because of the panic buying, but. Um, so I think the, um, uh, yeah, there, when you form economic policy, there's often unintended consequences if you do it in a hurry. Yeah. And, you know, the federal, so that, that's why you've seen 
Justin Trudeau. And, and I, you know, I'm going to give a shout out here to both the Prime Minister and the Premier. Completely different kinds of leaders, com like completely different agendas. Both of them, by and large, set aside those agendas and are crisis managing, and they're doing a very good job of it. I mean, their their messaging is very strong and consistent. I think they're listening, they're pivoting, um, they're accepting when there's problems. Like Ontario, the level of testing right now is appallingly low. Ford is saying, like, this is not okay. Okay, we need to do better. Um, you know, Trudeau, there were problems when they rolled out the first round of benefits. They said, yeah, we, we need to fix these. And then it's confusing, for sure. But guys, like, we're all making policy on the fly here. <laughs> and, and I mean, they, you know, they debated and approved $73 billion of relief on Easter Saturday. Like, this is so unprecedented. So uh, I think, you know, you sort of look at it and say, what did work? Well, they processed 6 million claims for that $2,000 a month benefit and I hope it doesn't cause those kinds of unintended consequences where people lose workers that they need if they do then you know you got to sort of say to yourself well can the wage subsidy be tweaked so that that doesn't happen because by and large it shouldn't and and with any full-time staff or people who are anywhere close to full-time hours that shouldn't be happening at that dollar amount um, so yeah, that's um, uh, it, that's a very good point. Thanks for that. And yeah, it's probably worth a, a whole another conversation. Thank you so much. Um, just lastly, I just wanted to shout out to the group as well. Um, if you're bringing, um, you know, if you're considering bringing co-op students on this summer um, for recovering ramp back up, you can reach out to Georgian College anytime. <laughs> and uh, a little, little self-serving there. Um, in addition to that, uh, Mayor Lehman, I just, the last, last thing I just wanted to quickly ask on, um, how are you doing and how are you uh, taking care of yourself during this time and then yeah. we'll get on with your day? <laughs> so the, one of the funniest tweets I saw early on in the crisis was like, I'm going to come out of this either 20 pounds lighter or 50 pounds heavier. And uh, the jury's still out, but I'm doing okay so far. <laughs> I had to self-isolate. I, I, I was one of the people who, uh, I had left for um, uh, for the states two days before everything went nuts, and um, and it, you know I sort of arrived and then the next day started trying to book my flight back. I can't you know because it was obvious that these things were changing so fast. So I worked from home, which like all of you are like all of us I think probably are doing or many of us. Um, you got to keep yourself busy, and I mean I will say like the. Zoom stuff, we're good. I, I know this is security issues and, and otherwise, but these online tools have been so helpful because when I start missing in-person contact, you know, you, I reach out and I'm, I've actually talked to some people that I haven't talked to in a long time. I've also not talked to people that I'm used to talking to every week, which is very weird. So anyway, I guess to answer your question, lots of online conversations and uh, uh, lots of walks. I, yeah. I wasn't a guy who went for walks. Now I'm a guy who goes for walks. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I just, I can echo the things that are coming up in the chat. Everyone is really grateful for your time and saying, we're all saying thank you to you um, for sharing this morning with us at the coffee talk. And um, I'm going to share the chat with your office, uh, Mayor Lehman, so that you can see um, some of the issues that were brought forward. And for everyone else that's on the call, all the participants, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I love that you're staying so connected to us and, and to this conversation. And um, I know I said this before, but it does feel in some ways that we're more connected than ever before. And the possibility to connect is just limitless. So uh, I appreciate all of you for joining us and Mayor Lehman. So hope everyone has a great week and we'll see you back next Monday. Um, Next Monday, we have joining us Mark Halperin, who's a fractional CFO, and Chris Adams uh, will be joining back again to have another open discussion similar to this, all around uh, budgeting, uh, forecasting, and cash flow, and how you can um, leverage marketing dollars for maximum impact, given that um, a lot of those dollars are now a lot smaller than they were before. So, um, love for you to join us at that next Monday and um, you can register through Eventbrite and we'll make sure that's included in our follow-up notes. The notes from this call will all be shared with all the participants. And so as always, we invite you to share your social media handles and, um, and contact details so that we can start to cross follow each other and uh, have more engagement online. Um, 
In the coming weeks, we have a couple of other online events taking place um, that I think will be very interesting to you. And I'm glad that Sven Hansen shouted out in the chat to join the Facebook group, Simcoe Entrepreneurs Network. And um, that will be shared as well through our outreach to you, um, just to keep this conversation going. As always, we're looking for suggestions for um, topics for the future coffee talks that will impact you directly. And um, yeah, stay connected with us and have a great week. Thank you so much for joining.